Advancing technology in ocean-based sensors has become crucial to weather forecasting and understanding the environment. But those things generating all the data need electrical power. Now a prize competition by the Energy Department and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration seeks new ways to power ocean observing platforms. Alejandro Moreno is Director of Water Powered Technologies at DOE. He talked with me about the sorts of technologies the agencies are looking for and why a prize challenge seemed like a good fit. Describe for us the, the, the types of sensing platforms that you're targeting here and maybe how they're powered today. And maybe that's not even the right way to phrase it because it seems like this is sort of a combination of, of existing platforms and, and future imagined platforms. That's exactly right, Jared. Um, the Ocean Observation Prize is a $3 million prize that was jointly developed by NOAA and DOE to catalyze innovation in ocean observing platforms and in the range of ocean observing platforms, whether they're static or, or dynamic, whether they're um, passive uh, or active sensing. Um, the objective is to enable uh, ocean observation systems to extract power from the local environment, namely from, from waves, waves or tides or other um, motion or, or pressure differentials in, in the ocean environment to enable greater data collection, the, the more persistent data collection, so either more data points over the same period of time or, or um, a much larger number of data points, or even more so, to, in, in speaking to your question about the future of, of data, to collect different types of data that are traditionally uh, collected in the ocean today. Um, and really what you see over the last 20, 30 years of ocean observation is a lot of physical oceanographic data, so temperature data, salinity data, pressure data, which is, is relatively easy to collect and to transmit. It doesn't cost a lot of energy and it doesn't cost a lot of bandwidth. Um, as ocean observation capabilities increase and as the, the thirst, so to speak, for knowledge of the ocean increases, a lot of additional types of data are primed to be collected. And this could be biological data, for example, um, eDNA, which is, is a new technique of understanding effectively w what are the characteristics of the marine environment by looking at the traces of DNA that's been left by, um, by animals and, and plants that have been in the vicinity. Um, that takes quite a bit of energy to collect and potentially to process in situ. Um, as well as geochemical data, which, again, is more energy intensive to collect. Um, in some cases, it requires new sensor technology as well. Uh, we want to make sure that energy limitations are not what's holding back the collection of, of new data that's going to be important for the scientific community, for, for commercial developments, for um, national security applications as well, potentially. Um, and also, of course, for, for data that already exists for platforms that are operated on, on batteries, I should say for, for sensing technologies that already exist, mostly either cabled or operating on batteries, um, the ability to, to extract power persistently from, from the local environment can dramatically reduce the costs of, say, shipping um, or other missions to replace the batteries or to bring the entire systems home, which is often uh, one of the major cost dri drivers of ocean observing. Right. And, and so obviously you don't know exactly yet the types of technologies that are going to come out of this challenge. Otherwise, you wouldn't be doing the challenge in the first place. But, but fundamentally, what gives you confidence that it, it is technically, scientifically possible to come up with new ways to, as you said, extract energy from the ocean itself? Well, we know it's scientifically possible. Our, our office has been working on this for 10, 10 plus years. Uh, DOE has had an office focused on wave and uh, tidal and ocean current power since the um, Energy Independence and Security Act of 2007, so for, for uh, 12 years running now. Um, and the question isn't the, feas the technical feasibility of extraction, the principles of extracting power from the waves and, and converting that to electrical, gener uh, electrical power on site is, is well understood. It's typically a reliability and cost issue. And so when you are looking to compete with solar power that's two or three cents a kilowatt hour for a large on cheap or, or that cost effective or somewhere close in order to make a dent and to have a real business case for large um, commercial grid powered electricity. Now we do a lot of research that's focused on bringing marine energy technologies down to competitive cost levels, but it's also we think very valuable to look at some of the the markets and some of the applications that really marine energy is is uniquely suited for, um, where the cost isn't measured in the cost per kilowatt hour of electricity, but it's measured in the cost of doing your mission or the capabilities for certain national security missions that don't necessarily exist. For example, powering sensors without any surface expression whatsoever, where solar power is not a, a viable option, wind power isn't a viable option, or keeping 
uh, ocean observation sensors and uh, or potentially unmanned vehicles, underwater sensing, doing their mission for much longer periods of time, collecting much longer data than's previously been imagined. So talk a bit about why, from your perspective, a challenge made sense um, for, for, for this particular type of, you know, innovation generation project. I mean, who are you trying to bring in here? Who's the target? Because, I mean, obviously both NOAA and DOE have plenty of organic research capabilities within your own labs. We do, and that's that's a terrific question, and it's one we think about a lot. Um, we have a number of different vehicles available to us to fund and to encourage uh, research, and some is, as you said, just direct funding to national laboratories who do outstanding research as part of the DOE family. Um, we also have competitive grants that we award for large um, items where we know we have a high degree of confidence of what we want to achieve and what's the best way to achieve it, and we can manage to very specific milestones. Um, but prizes and challenges we find very effective when we have a specific goal in mind, but we don't want to prejudge the best way to meet that goal. And on top of it, we want to bring together stakeholders from a wide range of different industries to work collaboratively together. And that's why the prize was so uh, appropriate for this ocean observing challenge, the, the prize structure. We wanted to make sure we were getting the insights, not just from the wave energy industry, but and not just from the ocean observation industry, but we were effectively creating a structure where the two industries could work together, members of the two industries, and create something fundamentally new. Um, and you know, being good stakeholders of, of government resources, um, we thought the most effective way and the most efficient way to do that wasn't to assume that we knew everything ahead of time and, and could effectively predict what these new technologies would look like, but that we would rely on, on the innovation and the entrepreneurship of American businesses and American inventors that could come together and tell us what the most effective, most innovative solution might be. Um, Another advantage for of the, the prize structure that, that we like very much is it gives an immediate leg up towards the commercialization and the actual market application of existing technologies. Um, it's another sort of aspect of innovation that, that the Department of Energy re considers very carefully in, in our projects and in our funding, but we don't want our, our work just to be a report on a, on a shelf or a piece of technology that never leaves the laboratory. And by doing a prize structure, if you think almost uh, of the TV show American Idol, um, the value to an American Idol contestant isn't just in winning the final prize, but it's in the exposure they get during the process. And we all know plenty of, uh, plenty of, of singers who have signed recording contracts even though they didn't win. And the prize uh, structure allows that same opportunity for contestants in the prize through the judging process or through the publicity of the prize itself to make their technologies and their approach known to a wide range of different potential end users or customers who may well end up being business partners or investors in their company. So everything you said about being open-minded about the ultimate solutions here makes total sense to me, but at the same time, you've got to bound it in some way, right? So, so what are you telling potential participants here that their submission needs to do or achieve in order to win? That's also the flip side, and that's that's a very good question. If, if, if we leave solutions open-ended to a problem that is open-ended, then, then we end up with um, no ability to really control the outcome. And so what we do is we create very specific metrics to explain exactly what we want. And I, and I can't talk about those metrics for... Um, for the Ocean Observation Challenge yet because we haven't formally launched it. Uh, but I can give an example with another prize that the DOE launched um, earlier this summer, and that was a prize to use wave power systems for remote desalination applications. It's called the Waves to Water Prize. And what we focused on there was creating a system that was cost-effective, but beyond that, also very easily shippable and deployable without any additional intervention or observation and um, sorry operation or maintenance and the reason for that being the objective of the potential technology that would come out would be that it could be easily deployed to a disaster zone and easily put in the water and operate when the power grid was down now one of the example metrics that we had to give them was that it had to be cheaper and easier to get on the ground than a case of water the equivalent weight of bottles of water. Fairly obvious. If you can't beat that, you don't have a lot of value in desalination. Right. Um, 
And so what we end up doing is identifying and, and requiring very specific parameters of functionality. So not of the way to get there, not of what the technology needs to look like, not of how to achieve that function, but here are the things that the ultimate design must be able to accomplish, and here are the constraints under which it must be able to accomplish them. Alejandro Moreno is Director of Water Powered Technologies at the Energy Department. We'll post this interview along with a link to more information at federalnewsnetwork.com slash Federal Drive. And you can hear the Federal Drive on demand. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Podcast One.